And good evening. We are doing it live right here weeknights in the 5 o'clock hour. Yabba Dabba do time here in Los Angeles. Motec on Money five nights a week for you. Live on the air here in 790 KBC. Streaming live online worldwide at KABC.com. And the on-demand Motec on Money podcast for you at KABC.com. Apple iTunes, all your favorite podcast platforms. Stocks ending the day higher today, helped by several blue-chip companies reporting stronger-than-expected results, and the earnings parade continued after the closing bell. Of course, markets still riveted to what's happening in the Middle East. Looking at the latest headlines from the Jerusalem Post, it says Israel faces rocket fire from Syria. Hamas fires barrage at Tel Aviv. We're following the very latest news here on the Middle East this evening. Israeli artillery forces struck the source of that uh, rocket fire from uh, Syria on the Golan Heights. According to the IDF, sirens sounded in several towns in Israel. The IDF said two rockets were launched at Israel from Syria and fell into open fields. We're following the latest headlines here as they come in. The stock market moving higher today by with the Dow up 205 points. NASDAQ moving higher as well by 121. The S&P 500 gained 30. The Dow snapping a four-day losing streak with help from the earnings news that came out today. Coca-Cola, for example, moving higher by 3%. GE up about 6.5%, 3M shares up 5%, and General Motors moving higher earlier, but now uh, closed down about 2%. We're also watching uh, the cryptos rally. Bitcoin above, well, 33000 almost 34000 now up another $300 at 33949 The crypto is suddenly coming to life in the last couple of days. Ethereum hovering at around 1788 and even Doge has moved up a fraction now at about seven cents. More political drama in Washington. Representative Tom Ember of Minnesota now becoming the latest House Republicans to hit a wall in his push to become a speaker as the congressman today opted to end his bid for the position, according to various sources. We're watching what's happening in the Middle East as well as in China with Governor Newsom visiting Israel over the weekend, and now he's visiting China to talk climate change, we're told. He got behind the wheel of a Chinese vehicle built by BYD Company. He's also visiting Tesla's new Chinese gigafactory and a wind farm there. I'll discuss this high-profile trip and what's also not being talked about during the visit with Susan Shelley, columnist for the Southern California News Group and host of the Howard Jarvis radio show heard Monday nights right here on 790 KBC. Also later this hour, I'll be speaking live with prominent Los Angeles attorney Richard Sandler, who has served as executive vice president, secretary, and trustee of the Milken Family Foundation. He's written about the true story of Michael Milken, titled Witness to a Prosecution, a first-hand account of one of the most high-profile financial cases of the 1980s. Richard Sandler will be joining me live later this hour. But first, on your money, the markets, and the economy, joining us live now is Jim Hausberg, Managing Director and Partner at Hightower Advisors and the Hausberg Group in Beverly Hills. He's also served on numerous boards, including the Concern Foundation for Cancer Research and JBS, Jewish Vocational Services in Los Angeles. Jim Hausberg, thank you very much for taking the call live with us here tonight on what was a strong day uh, for the market uh, for a change, uh, obviously with a lot of concern out there and hearts uh, still very heavy about what's happening in the Middle East. Give us your assessment of what's happening here at the moment. Yeah, it, it's pretty incredible, Frank, to see the markets up today based on the headlines you just gave us on so many things that are, are creating a lot of uncertainty. People have said this for years. The market doesn't like uncertainty, and we're certainly in one of those periods of time. Uh, what's going on in the Middle East is very sad, disturbing on several fronts. Um, and if the war does expand, that's obviously uh, going to be something that markets are going to be concerned with. We just kind of cross our fingers and hope that cooler heads prevail in some way. But just a horrible story. And then, of course, Ukraine, which has almost been forgotten, Frank, because of what's happened in Israel. Uh, but that's another war that we have to think about. And, you know, if you read other headlines, you hear about China and Taiwan. So it's really an uncertain global uh, environment. But uh, markets are still holding in there the uh, Unemployment numbers have been pretty good. The economy is going to put up a big print for the third quarter uh, coming later this week. Um, it could be in the 45 to 5% of GDP. Uh, interest rates, though, of course, have continued to move higher. The Fed hasn't raised. I kind of think they're going to hold off on raising. But the longer end of the market is backing up. Uh, Mortgage is over 8% a year ago, maybe 25 3%. Um, you know, I was looking at key bills uh, a year ago. Uh, for 90 days, 3.8, today, 5.5. So we've had just a huge, huge move in rates. And what I would say about that is it's not that rates are so high that the economy can't handle it, Frank. It's just the speed at which it's moved we've never seen before. Now rates are at the highest they've been for, you know, over 15 years. So 
um, you know, a lot to you know be concerned with, but uh, markets have a way of uh, sort of uh, fighting the wall of worry. Certainly, and and climbing that wall of worry, uh, that's the the old Wall Street adage. And and uh, right now, obviously, a very uh, uncertain that's time, given everything time. you just described. <laughs> yeah. Well, we see the price of oil uh, climbing after the uh, terror attack uh, on Israel, and it's um, it's been moving a bit higher now. Um, settled at eighty three seventy four a, a barrel today. Actually, pulled back a, a bit today. But it had been moving higher right after the uh, terror attack and Brent crude in London uh, pulling back uh, about nearly two dollars today, but still up there at eighty eight oh seven a barrel. Obviously, a lot of uh, concern about what's happening in the oil markets and, and that big uh, merger deal uh, with Chevron and Hess uh, this week. So uh, a lot of attention focused uh, on what's happening in the oil industry. What is your view of, of that sector uh, from an investment yeah. standpoint at this point? It's always a uh, sort of a tough uh, sector to focused on the price because, you know, when they give the inflation data out, they always say X food and energy because of the volatility. You know, we were over 93, 94 a barrel with the uh, war in the Middle East breaking out. I would have thought we'd see 100 by now, but we're in the, uh, you know, mid to high 80s. So it, it's difficult to say, but, um, you know, the energy stocks have had a very big run over the last year and a half uh, coming out of the pandemic. As you know, we've spoken for oil was at zero. We knew that wouldn't stay uh, or the futures were trading there. Um, so, you know, as the economies have reopened uh, around the globe, oil prices have moved higher. But if the economies do slow, which is a big concern out there that we finally do get to see the recession, oil prices could come down. Um, but for the most part, they pay good dividends. Uh, the pipelines uh, are good dividend payers. So if you're wanting to get a, a return through income with potential for growth, I think oil probably makes some sense. They just haven't been great long-term investments, right, compared to uh, – some other areas of the market. In fact, oil used to be a huge percentage of the S&P uh, going back in the 80s and 90s. It's less than 5 maybe 7% of the S&P now is made up of energy. So it's really shifted to technology over the last, you know, 20 years plus. All right. And then, of course, uh, and you're one of us right here in Southern California, Jim, uh, with this actor strike uh, continuing. Uh, Still no uh, deal yet, right? So uh, that's obviously weighing on the uh, the media stocks. We did get that resolution of the writers' strike recently, but uh, looks like they're still struggling on the actors' side here. And then the uh, the auto strike as well, uh, impacting General Motors stock today, which uh, moved more than two percent lower. The United Auto Workers Union announcing it was expanding a strike to include another uh, GM plant uh, in Texas. And this hot labor summer now spilling over into uh, fall. Uh, what's your assessment on the media names uh, and the auto names here? Well, I was talking to some people out here um, in the entertainment industry, and a whole lot doesn't get done in November and December when it comes to making films and TV. So if they don't come to some agreement, that thing's probably going to roll over into the beginning of the year. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll see an end to that. But there's been strikes, as we know, all around uh, the country. Uh, autos now are, are feeling in different places. We've seen hotel workers constantly out there. Um, there's been a big move towards labor. Uh, you know, I, I think if people can earn a decent wage, we can have a pretty good economy. Obviously, if the consumer is making more money, they're spending more. Could impact earnings of some companies of having to pay more. That's a big part of the inflation, obviously. When they look at CPI as labor and pence and, and, and a couple other uh, indicators. So, uh, you know, I have no idea if these things are going to end or if they're going to expand. But it's a, it's a concern for, you know, bottom lines and margins of companies if you have to pay more for workers. Uh, you know, it's obviously going to affect your bottom line, but the flip side is if workers are making more money, hopefully they're spending, and the economy continues to move along, which is quite frankly what we've seen for a while now. I know you don't have the uh, laser eyes on, uh, at least not in the past. Maybe you have them on tonight. Uh, with uh, Tough to ignore this uh, big move in Bitcoin all of a sudden to close to 34000 uh, Jim, uh, what are your observations yeah. here on what's happening in the crypto world? You know, somehow, uh, well, there's a few things that are happening. Number one, one of the biggest problems with these uh, various cryptos is the exchanges that they've traded on for a long period of time. There was issues with Coinbase for a while. Maybe they've figured that out. But obviously, FTX uh, and others. But now they're probably going to be listed on exchanges. And uh, there's going to be some ETFs that I think end up trading uh, where you can own Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and others. And I think that movement not to the uh, not to the exchanges with the SEC, you know, fo uh, following them, I think is is created a a a, a market that's going to make investors feel more comfortable. And I think that's been a big factor. Uh, I don't know if the uh, the breakout of the war in the Middle East is another reason. I don't understand if, how people are putting money into Bitcoin because of that. 
but there's definitely been a correlation recently, you know, over the past two weeks when there's fear around the globe, uh, Bitcoin tends to move up. So does gold for that matter, although that's been off a little bit. But it's uh, it's a world of its own, and maybe one day Frank will understand Bitcoin better, but it's very hard to figure out the valuation of, of any of these coins and what makes them worth more. Uh, some people say it's a greater fool theory. I've heard Warren Buffett say that he wouldn't, you know, buy take all the Bitcoin in the world for twenty you know, for a small amount of money because he has no idea what it's worth. And I don't think most investors do. So, uh, if someone could give me a bullish story on it. I, I'd be interested. I understand blockchain though, and that's pretty good technology. Uh, the ability to have this electronic ledger, uh, which I think helps obviously all these cryptos. But uh, it, it's just it, it, it's an alternative asset class that. Uh, is incredibly volatile. I think Bitcoin has doubled from the low earlier in the year. Uh, that I believe it hit 64,000, went down to 15, now 34. It's tough to stomach, Frank. It goes up because it goes up and, and goes down because it goes down. That's the analysis uh, I've heard. And uh, that's about the most plausible at this point. And gold, by the way, getting close to 2000, 1983 yeah. uh, for gold here at the moment, uh, pulling back uh, about $3 here, 1983.50 uh, at the moment for one ounce of gold. Now, uh, you mentioned technology, and of course, we had that AI rally earlier this year. Uh, looks like that's cooled off, uh, along with the, the Magnificent Seven, uh, so called. Uh, wh what are your thoughts about the AI space at this point and the uh, Magnificent Seven, which got so much attention this year? Well, you know, the AI space is for real. Uh, I think more and more uh, companies are going to be uh, investing in the space. It's, it's pretty incredible. But uh, NVIDIA, which makes the chips, has been a home run, um, probably goes higher over the next couple of years. Uh, Microsoft, which put money into chat GPT, is probably the, the safest way to play it. Uh, but the Magnificent Seven have done well. Tesla recently has sold off on earnings that weren't well as robust, but still. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I'm here to tell you what I would do, which is I ain't following the bankruptcy. Unless I owed a million dollars, something crazy, then I'm like, that makes sense. People be filing for bankruptcy for some old $10,000. No, there are other alternatives to file for bankruptcy that won't curtail your ability to make money. You want to know some of them? Here you go. There's credit counseling. Brown Ambition. Wherever you listen. Pretty darn good. Um, so that's affected them. But Google's been strong. Amazon's done well. Apple is down from its highs, clearly, but obviously a big player in that. So those stocks have held in there. The reason the S&P's up 11%, 30% uh, are in those seven names, and they've done very well over you know, the past 12 months plus. So uh, the market is not as broad-based as people would like to see it. Um, it's difficult to uh, you know, feel comfortable buying equities when we're faced with all these issues on a global basis. But if one were to become bullish, uh, you look at the fact that we haven't had a recession yet, maybe it's not coming. Uh, like I said, the uh, gross domestic product print is going to be pretty strong. Inflation, although higher than we're used to, has come way down from the 9% level to the 354 which is more manageable. And if the economy does slow, Frank, um, even though this is not consensus out there, you know, you could see the Fed lowering rates next year, which I think would be a uh, huge favorable. So there's there's a few bullish things out there. And, you know, one thing I've noticed after talking to investors for such a long period of time, a lot are fearful now. Usually a pretty good time to invest. It doesn't feel great. But when things are running away on the upside, people feel like investing. That's usually not a good time either. So, you know, buy quality, buy large cap, buy technology. Uh, it's not a time to speculate, you know, the smaller stuff and, and the story stocks. But um, I'd stay with the big names and technology and consumer. And, you know, you could sprinkle in some industrials, too. Um, and I hate to, you know, get play on war, but, you know, the defense stocks tend to do well. But there's uh, troubles around the world. So you can look at the racing irons and the Rockwells and the Boeings as, you know, possible places to hide for a while. On the live with Jim Hausberg, and uh, we see Microsoft uh, blowing past earnings estimates uh, after the closing uh, bell today. Uh, Jim, Microsoft certainly has come to life uh, with all this AI stuff. Uh, what about uh, Microsoft and, and Alphabet Google, which also reported today? Yeah, well, you know, Microsoft is probably, as I just mentioned, the name even caught me off guard on that a little bit. But, uh, you know, it, it's an incredible uh, business. Um, you know, it's it's that company that's going to end up probably being the biggest market capital, hit $3 trillion, probably hit $4 trillion, uh, down the road. It's just a hard number to even uh, you know comprehend. 
but uh, it's up four percent in after hours. They're they're just doing incredibly well, well managed. Uh, Tim Cook's done an incredible job for a long period of time, and everybody uses their products as software as a service. You know, they're continually paying uh, every month for the services is huge. There's other companies obviously that fall into that. Um, Snowflake's another good name, maybe in the space, but you know, Microsoft's the leader. It's the bellwether. I think in periods like this of uncertainty, you know, you're only apples and the Microsofts. Um, they've been a good place to, to, to be. And I don't know the breakdown in the earnings, but I'm sure the numbers were great, both top and bottom line. Last year was the crypto winter and this year, the, the bond winter, right? So, uh, what about uh, <laughs> folks looking at that 60-40 uh, portfolio? Uh, bonds were supposed to be the uh, the protection, right? Um, what are you telling folks uh, about the performance of the bond market and where things go from here? Well, I'm a buyer of bonds right now. Have been for a little while. Didn't catch the uh, the bottom, but I think buying you know treasuries over five percent, corporates in the five and a half six range, you know tax free bonds four percent going further out. I think it works for a portfolio. I got to tell you, Frank, you know, you mentioned the 60-40. If you look at the 60-40 over the past several years, it's been awful. You know, stocks have had, you know, last year we're down 20%. The bond market was down 13 I mean, that, you know, the worst year ever for a, a, a balanced portfolio. But when you take a look now, you take that step back and say, okay, I can buy bonds today at 5%. If equities can get me the long-term return over time, 9 to 10 you know, I can see myself earning 70%, and that's certainly better than inflation. So even though bonds have not worked well, and even though bonds are probably going higher, you know, because obviously we have to fund this huge deficit of $33 trillion, of which they're supposedly adding $2 trillion, $6 trillion over the next seven to eight years, which is a big concern for people. Uh, you could see rates go to 6%, and some even say 6 and a half, 7 That doesn't seem to be the consensus. But even if you're buying bonds today and rates go up, you're still locking in a good return. Don't forget, a year, two, three ago, you were getting 1% in the 10-year Treasury. You know, Today, you're getting 4.85%. So you can live with that. And I think a lot of investors would rather buy bonds today at that 5% rate, and I'm just using that as a magic number, versus equities with the volatility that we see. So uh, I think the 60-40 is a very interesting time. But uh, again, as always, when it comes to the equity market, you've got to be a long-term holder. You can't get out during these tough periods, even though it seems more comfortable um, just to be on the side. But it's very tough to get back in and know when to get back in. So I like the 60-40 day, Frank. All right. Let me, let me take you by surprise with my next question here. Where are you putting money now, Jim, and where are you taking off the table? Um. Well, I'm not really taking off the table in too many places. Um, if I were, I would tend to move out of some of the smaller stuff into the larger names, as I just mentioned before. I would add money from cash into bonds. I wouldn't go out 20 or 30 years, but I'd certainly go in the two to five, seven year, maybe 10 year on some ladder it out there, lock in rates for a longer period of time. Um, I'd sooner own growth uh, over value because if we do have a slowdown in the economy, Growth tends to not necessarily outperform, but there's always going to be areas in the market that are doing better than the overall economy. And I think growth stocks, as much as they were down last year and as much as some have been hit this year, still have been the place to be. So um, I, I lean on growth, but I wouldn't give up on value. The banks are way down. There's some pretty good dividends there. Um, there's some good consumer names out there. I'm still a believer in the equity market long term, always will be. Um, I think when you look over these various periods of time where the markets have come down for multiple reasons, it's always been a good time to add to positions that you feel comfortable owning. And that's probably what we're seeing right now. And before I let you off the hook here, uh, Jim, uh, you're actively uh, involved uh, as one of the uh, board members of, of JVS here in Los Angeles, Jewish Vocational Services, which uh, has been a great uh, economic uh, engine here and has helped a lot of people out. Um, can you tell us about any events uh, they're having and, and uh, tell us what we need to know about uh, JVS? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Frank. JVS has uh, uh, been around for about a long time, uh, 80 years or so. Um, helping people with barriers to employment. That's what we're all about. Um, we've got some wonderful people uh, within our organization helping those, you know, from welfare back to work, uh, immigrants, uh, all displaced workers. Uh, you know, we help people, we train people. Um, it's JVS, now called JVS SoCal. Um, so you can look us up at uh, jvssocal.org. 
Uh, read about us. If you feel comfortable, we'd love to get a donation from you. We do have multiple events throughout the year. We have our Women's Leadership Network Conference, which is coming up uh, soon here in the early November. Um, it's a what that we've raised over a million dollars, and it's really geared towards uh, helping women who are out of work, again, with the same barriers to employment. Um, and uh, we just do great things. That, uh, I love the organization for what we do. We have a great board, great uh, executives running it now. Um, I was just lucky to be involved with it, and um, we help a lot of people. And, That's great. Um, you know, we always are, are in need for more help. That's great, Jim. I remember when you honored uh, Tommy Lasorda at one of the big events uh, over the years, the late yeah, great Tommy Lasorda. And thank you so much, Jim, for that uh, thorough assessment uh, of uh, everything here, uh, as well as the uh, great uh, JBS story as well here in Los Angeles. That is Jim Hausberg with Hightower Advisors and the Hausberg Group in Beverly Hills. Jim, it's always great to speak with you. Thanks very much again for taking the call tonight. My pleasure, Frank, and thank you for all the support over the years. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Friends, if you're hurt in an accident, you need an experienced advocate. And Clark Fielding and his team of sharks at Fielding Law are on standby ready to dive into your case. My friend Clark the Shark is fearless for justice and your go-to attorney when injured in an accident that wasn't your fault. Whether it's a car accident, slip, trip, fall, or any kind of personal injury, Fielding Law is here to make sure you get the care, attention, and compensation you deserve. Fielding Law can assess the circumstances of the case, negotiate tenaciously with the insurance companies, and if necessary, file a lawsuit and litigate to seek fair compensation on behalf of you, the injured party. An injury is a major disruption in your life. Medical expenses, lost wages, pain and suffering, property damage, and other losses incurred as a result of the injury are all part of the damages. Don't try and handle the process alone. You need an expert in the process, and the team at Fielding Law are the ones to trust. Put Clark Fielding's number in your phone under the word accident. That number is 833-88-SHARK, 833-88-SHARK, or go to ClarkTheSharkLaw.com. My tag of money continues here in 790 KBC. Good evening. The Dow positive today by 205 points, snapping a four-session losing streak. And we're back to 33,141. The latest earnings news helping propel the market higher. The S&P 500 of 31 at 42,848. And the NASDAQ up 121 at 13,140. Cryptos on the rise. Bitcoin up about 300 now, back to 33,949. Ethereum up 16 at 1,788. And Doge at 7 cents. The yield in the 10-year note, which impacts the fixed-rate mortgage rates, now at 4.83%. Motaga Money continues here in 790 KBC. Good evening. California Governor Gavin Newsom visiting Israel over the weekend, and now he's visiting China to talk climate change. We're told he got behind the wheel of a Chinese vehicle built by BYD Company. He also visited Tesla's new Chinese gigafactory and a wind farm there. Let's talk about this uh, high-profile international trip now and uh, also what's not being talked about during this visit. Joining us live now, Susan Shelley, columnist for the Southern California News Group and host of the Howard Jarvis Radio Show, heard Monday nights right here on 790 KBC. Susan Shelley, take it from the top and, and tell us about what uh, Governor Newsom is doing uh, on this uh, international journey. Well, it's pretty obvious that Governor Newsom is on a photo tour, having pictures taken for the campaign brochures, showing him in foreign countries with foreign leaders doing things that he thinks are going to help him with the voters, which is unfortunate because in Israel he's just exploiting all the tragedy and grief and stress and tension that's going on there for campaign photos. He was in and out in one day, and he met with leaders and soldiers and families and individuals who have one woman whose son is held hostage and it's just like boom 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 thank you very much picture former navy seal mike ritland keeps it real on the mike drop podcast former navy seal and current crossfit king dave castro is there one thing that you took away from the seal community that you apply kind of in your everyday life here's the reality so getting out was a no-brainer financially able to provide for my family much better with crossfit yeah. than i was with the navy but if it hadn't been for crossfit i for sure would have stayed in for 20 i loved what i did mic drop raw unfiltered intellectually sound wherever you listen taken next and you can get all the high resolution photos on the governor's website it's pretty cynical and the trip to china he's promoting zero emission vehicles without mentioning that china is building coal-fired plants china is on a building binge i have some numbers for you in the first half of 2023, construction was started on 37 gigawatts of new coal capacity, and 52 gigawatts were permitted, and another 41 gigawatts of new projects announced, 
and they took eight gigawatts of projects off the shelf and reinstituted them after they were not going to go forward. So what they're doing has no uh, – accepting the terms of the discussion that you have to stop coal in order to save the planet, what they're doing in China is not that. They are building coal. They're generating electricity. And why? Because last summer they had an electricity shortage, and so did we. And what are we doing? We're going to China and talking about climate partnerships as if this isn't happening. It's it's so expensive for the people of California to pretend that we don't need to build fossil fuel electricity plants. It's so costly for all the businesses and the residents here. It's really it's such a big lie. On the air live with Susan Shelley, tax Payer watchdog extraordinaire, a first and foremost a columnist for the Southern California News Group and host of the Howard Jarvis Radio Show Heard right here on 790 KBC. Now, let me ask you this. I understand that he has signed already or, or is about to sign this new memorandum of understanding with uh, one of the Chinese provinces on, on climate issues. I thought only the federal government, not states, can uh, do that sort of thing. Well, apparently this is something that Governor Jerry Brown did, and this is an update on it, but you're certainly right. Uh, it's not something that a governor of one state in the United States should be doing. Uh, I think the uh, the argument would be that it's comparable because he's signing this with a provincial government, but of course we know that China is a communist dictatorship and it's not a federalist republic, and so there is nothing comparable here. This is just for campaign photos. And it's really unfortunate because the people of California are paying too much for electricity. And Governor Newsom's policies are directly responsible for that. On the live with Susan Shelley. So uh, we're paying for this whole trip? Oh, yeah. I believe we are. I believe we are paying for it because this is California making a sister cities type of deal. Uh, So I don't think it's being paid for by his campaign. But you raise an interesting point. He is not a declared candidate for president. He has not filed paperwork with the Federal Election Commission. He's not filing campaign reports. So he's either using campaign money left over from his campaigns for governor or he's using taxpayer money and calling it uh, state business. But it's really obvious that this is just the pre-presidential campaign photo op tour to be photographed in foreign places with foreign leaders to look like a world leader comparable to people who have really done it. It's just unfortunate. Or right, I mentioned uh, BYD, the Chinese uh, electric vehicle maker. He did stop by there. Now, this uh, last time we heard about uh, BYD was during during the COVID days, right? Do you remember that? That's right. And they were they were responsible for wasting some of the taxpayer money on masks, as I recall. Yeah, they were uh, was was one point four billion dollars uh, awarded in the mask contracts uh, to that uh, company by uh, California back during the uh, the COVID days. So it was interesting to hear more about that. Uh, Governor Newsom bought about a billion dollars, a billion and a half dollars of masks from the Chinese company at the outset of the COVID pandemic. So we're, we're watching that. Um, and Susan, while we have you on the line, uh, what are some of the other uh, taxpayer issues that you're following there at the Howard Jarvis uh, Taxpayer Foundation and, and also um, the effort to repeal that so-called uh, death tax and, and your latest efforts there? Well, on the repeal of the death tax, this is going very well. People are downloading the petition from the website, printing it at home, sending it in. Everyone can get this legally valid petition at repealthedeathtax.com and sign it. And this will reverse the biggest property tax increase in the history of California, which was hidden inside Proposition 19. That's the one in 2020 that looked like it was about helping wildfire victims. It looked like it was about helping seniors, but hidden inside it, was a new a new set of rules for inherited property. We lost the ability for parents and children to transfer property to each other without a tax increase. So now when it's transferred, it's reassessed to current market value and everybody owes taxes on the current market value of that family property as of the date of transfer and it's devastating people. It's just devastating. So we want to repeal it. The repeal of the death tax initiative is retroactive so that everyone who was caught in this would be able to get their original assessed value reinstated. And that's at repealthedeathtax.com. We need a million signatures, and we need them fast before January 15th. So everybody should get on that, tell everyone you know, and get those signatures in to get this on the ballot next November. So many heartbreaking stories uh, since that was uh, passed right, and uh, I'm sure you've heard uh, even more uh, in recent weeks. 
I have. Just today I was hearing a story about a, a, someone who actually did move into the parents' home but maybe didn't complete the paperwork in time and so was reassessed, and the assessed value of the home went up by a factor of five and this huge new tax bill. And, of course, because the assessors are so backed up with Prop 19 because it was as – Assess, L.A. County Assessor Jeffrey Prang called it a dumpster fire, this law, because it was so poorly written. They're so backed up with processing the claims that people are getting bills for two years of taxes with a note that they have to pay it by November. And people can't do it. People can't come up with $28,000 was one figure that I heard by November. And then there's the, the counties are telling them, well, if it turns out that you're right and you don't, oh, it will give it back to you. Well, how many people can come up with that money and just wait a year or two years or however long it takes to process that claim? It's terribly unfair. It's a huge amount of money. This was such a poorly thought out law. And it has to be fixed. It just has to be fixed because it's devastating people. They're being forced to sell property that they shouldn't have to sell because they, maybe in, in some cases they don't even owe these taxes, but they can't fight it. So it's, it's really just so unfair. And it's wrecking people's plans. Trusts do not protect you from this. Assessors look through the trust and reassess based on who is the present beneficial owner. So a lot of people are getting caught flat-footed thinking that they had everything squared away, and then getting these enormous tax bills, which then will continue annually. This is not like an estate tax once. This is property tax every year. And I've never seen anything that hit people in such a negative way to such a degree that the, that the government is just fine with. They don't want to do anything to correct it. So we're going to correct it with the initiative. Susan, and thank you very, very much for that. We do appreciate it, and thanks for highlighting this important issue with us here. That is Susan Shelley, columnist for the Southern California News Group and host of the Howard Jarvis Radio Show, which is heard Monday nights right here on 790 KBC. Motaka Money continues here on 790 KBC. And joining me live now is prominent Los Angeles attorney Richard Sandler, who has served as executive vice president, secretary, and trustee of the Milken Family Foundation. Mr. Sandler is also on the board of trustees, chairs the board of trustees of the Jewish Federations of North America, and is the former chair of the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. His latest book is on the true story of the iconic financier, philanthropist, and entrepreneur Michael Milken, titled Witness to a Prosecution. Mr. Sandler, thank you very much for coming to the line, and certainly uh, had a chance to speak to Michael Milken about his latest book, of Faster Cures, at the Milken Global Conference in Beverly Hills this year. And I know you also organize the Middle East uh, Global Conference and, and following what's happening in the Middle East very closely. While we have you on the line here, sir, first of all, give us your reaction to the, the terror attack uh, on Israel and the, the reaction that we've seen uh, since then. Well, thank you very much for asking and for having me on this afternoon. Um, it's been very hard to think about anything else for the last couple of weeks. Uh, the devastation that happened there is something that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. It's things that I'd read about that happened many, many years ago, whether it was the pogroms or the Holocaust. And to think that something like this could happen, you know, in Israel just is really a wake up call to how much hate there is in the world. Certainly unthinkable has happened. And um, tell us about the reaction here in the Jewish community and across the country to what has happened and what Israel's uh, next move might be, sir. Well, with respect to the community, it has certainly uh, mobilized the community. It's brought tremendous solidarity. I think everybody has come together, shocked by this, um, realizing that the needs of the people of Israel, uh, the humanitarian needs, the medical needs, the trauma, and all those types of needs are great. And a lot of work is being done to raise the resources that are needed and that will be needed for many, many months to come. So my work at the Jewish Federation, I, you know, I've seen the Federation mobilize. Fortunately, we have people on the ground. Uh, and in our work with Jewish Federation in North America and the Jewish Agency, I uh, know where the money needs to go to make sure that it goes to the right place. And a lot of work is being done. As for the next moves in Israel, you know, anybody can speculate. I certainly am not privy to that. I am sure that the people there are highly confident. Uh, confident of what they're doing. They're working around the clock, and I'm sure that at the right time we will find out. We've had the honor over the years to uh, speak to uh, the most prominent uh, at the Milken Institute, including Michael Milken himself, who was on this program earlier this year, and of course uh, Kevin Cloudon's a frequent guest here, uh, one of the top economists there, and and you've written uh, about the the true story of Michael Milken. You were 
with him through that ordeal. Um, that prosecution, right, uh, was spearheaded by uh, Rudolph Giuliani and and ultimately uh, he was pardoned by um, by President Trump in recent years. Uh, tell us about your book, sir. Okay, well, you know, thank you for asking. I've been thinking about doing this for a long time. You know, Michael, as much as he had always tried to shun publicity, came to realize that's not going to work. And he seems to still be a lightning rod for many articles that are written in business publications and the same lies keep getting repeated as to what he did, how he did it, et cetera. So I lived it. This is something that I did every day, day in and day out for over 10 years, uh, representing Mike and sort of putting together his legal team. And I know the truth because I was there and I just felt it was time that the truth be told as to what really happened, how did it happen, and why did it happen? And that's the reason that I sat down you know, and wrote the book, and it's based upon my own personal knowledge and a lot of information that comes from court documents, comes from government attorneys who were involved at the time that I had at a class that I taught at Stanford Law School. So I'm very confident that I can stand behind everything that's in this book. And the book is not just the story of Michael Milken, which I think is interesting in and of itself, but it's also a story of it could happen to you. It's a story of how the prosecutorial system works, the powers of prosecutors. And if you have certain amount of notoriety and a prosecutor feels that it's good for his or her career, they have the power to make a lot of, uh, I guess, a lot of publicity for themselves and enhance their own careers based upon their prosecution of you. And I just think it's sort of a warning as to people knowing how the system works and why they should be concerned about it. And the book is titled Witness to a Prosecution, The Myth of Michael Milken. And we're on the air live with the author right now, prominent Los Angeles attorney Richard Sandler. And now Mr. Milken is about to uh, unveil the uh, Center for the American Dream, right, uh, in Washington. Tell us about that. And, and certainly he's lived the American Dream. Yeah, it's, the, um, it's called the Milken Center for Advancing the American Dream. The purpose of it is to show that there is hope. It's a positive story um, about what people have accomplished. It's also a story about what we still need to do as a society to make sure this dream is available to everybody on the same basis. But it talks about how people, even with tremendous obstacles before them, have been able to realize the American dream. And what we've done is we're interviewing up to, we will have probably 10,000 interviews by the time we are done of how people view the American dream. And it's interesting. The American dream really is the ability of a person to reach their potential based upon their talent, their ethics, their work ethic, um, and nothing else. And we have seen a lot of people accomplish it with, as I said, with obstacles in front of it people that have accomplished it coming from other countries to the United States, even today, Frank, throughout the world, there's no place on earth that people want to come to uh, more than the United States of America because they feel here they'll have opportunities they won't have anywhere else. So this center is to tell the stories of all kinds of people from all kinds of walks of life, from all parts of the world, uh, what they have done, how they have done it, and what you can do to realize your American dream. That's beautiful. Richard Sandler, wish we had even more time here and hope to have the chance to speak with you uh, more often here uh, and get your views, uh, especially on what's happening in the Middle East. We wish you uh, and the entire Milken family all the very best. Again, the book is titled Witness to a Prosecution, The Myth of Michael Milken. Prominent Los Angeles attorney Richard Sandler, thank you very much uh, for taking the call here this evening. Well, I thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, and stay tuned now for the 790 KBC News Blitz with Royal Oaks. This is Motac on Money on 790 KBC. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I'm here to tell you what I would do, which is I ain't following the bankruptcy. Unless I owed a million dollars, something crazy, then I'm like, that makes sense. People be filing for bankruptcy for some old $10,000. No, there are other alternatives to file for bankruptcy that won't curtail your ability to make money. You want to know some of them? Here you go. There's credit counseling. Brown Ambition. Wherever you listen.